today, <clears throat> the name of the sermon is Work It Out. Work It Out, and we're talking about the armor of God. Today we are talking about the helmet, the helmet of salvation. Okay, So we have a couple of props, and uh, they're going to bring them up. We're going to do a little bit of explaining why they bring them up. So I think these are, um, this was a, a pretty cool find, as you can see here. Um, I just like the way it looks. I'm going to put them in my office. It's pretty cool, right? I want to wear it around the house today. So if you see me cutting the lawn with this helmet on, just beep your horn, okay? So uh, I'm going to be cutting my lawn with my Roman helmet on. And uh, it was pretty interesting when you start looking this up and finding out, um, uh, they call this one the, the top, the plume. But uh, with the plume, they're saying this red uh, belongs to a certain brigade. So every, every brigade had a different color plume. Some were yellow, some were black, some were purple. But some were the ones who were the infantry, the ones who were riding the horses. And they had white plumes, it depended on what region you were in. But all the plumes meant something different, OK? So the helmet, uh, its ultimate goal is to protect your head, right? You get smacked in the head, it's over. So um, each part of it, obviously, uh, to cover their ears, <clears throat> even the visor that they had was to cover them from the sun so they wouldn't be blinded. And one of the most important things about the helmet was actually the back of the neck shield. So a lot of times they would say they would try to you know, chop their head off. So this would stop the blade <clears throat> from cutting the back of the head. So, but the ultimate purpose of the helmet is to protect what's inside, right? And then we have a modern day helmet. Talk to one of our sheriff's deputies. This is a riot helmet. And yes, um, they can stop a bullet and uh, stop getting from getting hit in the head by a stone or baton. So this is a modern day helmet and, and it has a certain paper purpose, what? To protect what's inside, right? So, so we have two examples a uh, quick story as we start opening up some of these scriptures to you. Um, I remember I was a chaplain for sh two counties for the Sheriff's Department. And I remember the first time, first month I worked for him, we were on a call. And um, he had said, hey, chap, buckle up, we're, we're going. I was already buckled up, but he meant we're going to go faster. So we're going to a call, and there was 10 motorcycles uh, that were hit by uh, someone who was under the influence alcohol and drugs and they crossed the line and these motorcyclists they were hit by this individual and there was 10 of them and as we got there uh, and we got our feet on the ground there was one car there there was a whole a whole slew of uh, sheriff deputies coming and on their way from all parts of the county and we we're going to each motorcycle rider and they were they were strolling all over the place probably within 100 yards. They were lying here and lying there and motorcycle and, and uh, very bloodied and, and uh, bruised. <clears throat> and as we were running, he had told me on the way there, he said, listen, he said, the ones who have the helmets on, he said, just leave them. He goes, go to the ones who don't have the helmets on. And I said, well, how do you know that? He goes, because we live in Wisconsin. And he goes, we don't have a helmet law. And he goes, they don't understand. So they had a saying on the sheriff's department saying the difference between an old open casket and a closed casket is if you're wearing a helmet. So wear your helmet. So as they were saying, um, and uh, you know when you're a motorcyclist, and I, I had a motorcycle and I, I like the feeling of riding without a helmet. And you know they want the wind in your hair. And to see what the wind does to your hair? <laughs> All right. So say no more. Put your helmet on. All right. So it's a losing battle. So what happens is, is you turn around and so we're, we're going out and you can see the ones. What was really interesting, the three people who didn't have their helmet had so much trauma and they were, the three of them were dead. There was a husband and wife and then another, a son to that family as well who weren't hit wearing their helmets at 65 miles an hour and getting hit by a vehicle. Some of them weren't even hit by a vehicle but they had to go off the road into the farm fields and that head isn't made to take that kind of trauma, thus protect the helmet, right? Helmet is for to protect the, the brains. So as, as this happened and we're going out, 
I just remember <clears throat> in these motorcycle, most of them were Harleys, and it was a bagger, and it had a luggage rack on the back. <clears throat> in the back of the luggage rack, these motorcycles were strewn all over. But I remember seeing the luggage rack open, <clears throat> cracked open, and I seen the two helmets and you know, the husband and wife that were strewn in the field that were, were both uh, DOA when we, when we came on the site. I just remember seeing their helmets inside of this luggage rack. And I thought, man, if they would have just wore that helmet, if they would have protected that head inside, they'd still be alive. And instead, when you see the motorcycle all kind of crinkled up, you see the luggage rack cracked open, you hear you seeing those two helmets in there, and the husband and wife, and also the son as well, who were laying dead in the field. So when you see that, you understand how terrible it can be, how the helmet is, is very important. It protects uh, the brain center, right? <clears throat> so this morning, we're talking about the helmet of salvation. And uh, I know it's pretty graphic, and it's Mother's Day, and we shouldn't get all that graphic, but we're going to go someplace with this, so just hang on, okay? So the definition of the Christian doctrine of salvation, also called deliverance or redemption, is the deliverance of a human being for eternal punishment of sin that separates us from God. It is granted by God's grace <clears throat> to those who accept God's conditions of repentance who believe in Jesus Christ, his resurrection, and they accept him as Lord and Savior. So we talk about this, and there's a transformation uh, in our salvation. So if we go to our first scripture, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 14 through 17, and this is our staple <clears throat> scripture that we've been teaching off of, verse 14, stand firm with a belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. So we've, we've heard this, the armor of God, so much, and what we've been doing over the last few weeks is, is tearing this apart and explaining it from piece to piece. Verse 17 is our focus this morning. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. So we're talking about a helmet of salvation. So when a soldier is suited up for battle, the helmet was the last piece of armor to go on. It was the final act of readiness and preparation to combat. A helmet was a vital for survival, protecting the brain, the command station for the rest of the body. If the head was badly damaged, the rest of the armor would be useless. So our first scripture this morning is Romans 1.6. <clears throat> for I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God. Two, and there's that special word that we're talking about, the helmet of salvation. So it's the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes. Matthew 10.28. Do not fear those who can kill the body, but who cannot kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both body and soul. I think the scripture is so pertinent when we understand, when we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, and now we're talking about our spirit, because our body is made up of our soul, our body is made up of our spirit that God gives us, and also our body is this, this, this human being that we have here. And these three, almost like the Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. So we have the Spirit of God. We have our soul that belongs to your identity. And then you have your body. So when we, we're given, uh, when we accept Christ as our Lord and Savior, we have our salvation in Christ, right? So I think this scripture, next scripture, will bring this to a little bit more reality. We're in Philippians chapter 2, verse 12. Therefore, my dear friends... As you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, this is the Apostle Paul teaching the people of Philippi, but now much more in my absence. So he's leaving. He's been there. He's invested the time. Now he's gone. And he said, but now more in my absence, continue to work it out. Your salvation with fear and trembling. So the name of this sermon is where I, I, I took this name was work it out. 
because we, we become Christians and we have that. That's why I said in the men this morning, you remember that special time when you, you decided that you wanted to be a follower of Christ, that you wanted him to be the Lord of your life. And everyone has that special time when you say, yep, I remember that time when I invited him in, that he became the Lord and Savior of my life. And he comes in, and that, that first thing, and that's where they say, well, that's salvation, because we believe that he died on the cross for our sins. We believe three days he rose again, and he's our Savior. And then what happens is we, we say, okay, so we're saved. Our spirit, our soul, our, our spirit from God, we feel this, and we invite him in. In Revelations, he says, he walks at the door, or he knocks at the door of our heart, and he waits for us to invite him in. So he's, he's waiting for us to say, Lord, I want you to be Lord of my life. And then that, that special time comes, and our salvation comes through Christ. But here's what happens, again, in, in uh, Philippians 2.12. He's saying, but now, he said, now that I'm gone, continue to work it out, uh, your salvation with fear and trouble. And he said, you know, now, now that you've come in and accepted Christ, you know what, there's got to be a change. There's got to be a change. Something's got to happen to me. But it doesn't happen alone. We know, we talked about this last week and the week before, that it's the Holy Spirit that comes in and helps us do that changing. It's that power of God, that Holy Spirit that helps us change. So we're not doing that change by ourselves or in our flesh. So Paul is telling them, he goes, you need to work it out. <clears throat> you need to make that change. And, and I remember when I first became a Christian and I was working in a factory, and, um, <clears throat> you know, when you come in and before Christ, B.C., before Christ, and you don't know and you don't have that foundation of Christ, your thinking is different. Your language is different. Your, your whole mannerism is different. And, and one day someone comes in and tells you the power of Christ and you scratch your head and you're a little interested in, and you start learning more of the gospel <clears throat> and you invite him in. But then all of a sudden he comes in and then this the spirit and his presence starts convicting you of, of things that you could have talked or maybe you cursed or, or your thought life wasn't lined up biblically. It wasn't what God has commissioned or asked us to do. But all of a sudden, we start, he starts working on our soul. He starts talking to you personally. And he starts coming to you and he says, you know, we need to work this out. And, and pretty soon you start seeing this transition and if you don't, you should be. Because if you have the living spirit of God inside of you, he doesn't allow you to be the same. He's transforming us into his image. So let's go to the next uh, scripture. We'll talk about this a little bit more. In 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5. <clears throat> Casting down all arguments <clears throat> and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. So... We accept Christ as our Lord and Savior. And what happens? Casting down all arguments and even high things that exalt itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Well, you know, I worked, I worked in a factory for 20-some years and eventually became a supervisor there and a superintendent there. And boy, I tell you, there's, there's times when you're working, you're working among the, the other guys and there's cussing, there's swearing. It, it doesn't bother you. You become numb to it. And, and pretty soon you're around it and it becomes part of you and it becomes part of your language. And, and pretty soon all of a sudden I, I became a Christian and gave myself to Christ <clears throat> and learned, hey, people don't talk like that. People shouldn't talk like that. There has to be a reverence to God. And, and I started learning that. And he starts cleaning up the soul man. And he starts talking to you and saying, you know, some of that unforgiveness that you're holding, that's not okay. That's not God-like. It's not what the gospel teaches us, but it teaches us forgiveness. And it teaches us to be able to, and even godly tolerance. So God is saying there's a transition, and that when we have those thoughts, we're supposed to hold them captive. So when Paul's talking about the helmet, he's saying, hey, listen, you see this, this brain center? When we accept Jesus Christ, and there is this incredible transition, he's saying, this salvation, the helmet representing the salvation from God, right? So you have it, and all of a sudden there's this change. And all of a sudden there's a different thought pattern. There's a different thought life. <clears throat> and this transition's happening. And he's saying, with this helmet, protect it. And he's saying, not only protect it, but every day hold it captive. So 
if I have a thought that's coming, if I don't like somebody, and, and, and I'm thinking about them saying, why do I not like this person? What's happened to me? What, why is that o not okay? And have I forgiven them? Have, have I done something to hurt them? Have I said I'm sorry? Have I, have I turned around and turned the other cheek? And <clears throat> we have to understand when we're put on the helmet of salvation, he's saying, hey, this gospel, you don't just hear it. He's saying, protect it. You don't just hear it, but it has to become one accord with you. Because if we're just hearers of the word and not doers of the word, that's not the gospel of Jesus Christ. We need to hear it, and it needs to become us. It has to become our own spiritual DNA. And that's why he's saying, hey, if you have these thoughts that are not lining up with the word of God, guess what? You're out of tune. You're out of sync. And he's telling us right here that what are you supposed to do? He says, bring every thought captive. Grab that thought, don't let it out, don't live it out, don't speak it out, but hold it captive. And know that thought's not lining up biblically, hold it captive. So that's what I think is so, so precious when we start hearing about the helmet of salvation. He's telling us how to live it out. Romans 6.11, <clears throat> it says, Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. So he's saying, after we accept it and, and we know this transition, we're supposed to make um, a decision to walk away from that life, to walk away from that sin, and to be more in God's, God's image. Ephesians 1.13, we talked about before, we have this transition, it's salvation, but God doesn't intend us to do it alone. And this is what I love about Scripture, and you'll see it on the screen right here, he tells us we're not expected to do it alone, but he gives us a guarantee. And th this is for everyone in the room. And, and if you're wondering, well, okay, I'm, I'm hearing the word, but there's a guarantee about being a believer. And this is a, excellent up here. So in, in, in him, you also, when you heard the word of truth, the good news of your salvation, or is that special word salvation, as a result, as a result believe in him. We are stamped with the seal, the promise of the Holy Spirit. The one promised by Christ as owned and protected by God. So look at what, what it says up here. This is right from the gospel. This is an amplified version. He's saying, when you made that decision, when you made that decision and you've opened that door and you've allowed God into your heart, he says, you know what happened on that time? And you chose and you believe in God as your Lord and Savior. You're a follower of God, this transition. But he says, here's what happens. And I love how he gives this uh, uh, explanation. We're stamped in the seal, the promise of the Holy Spirit. So I'm going to good example for this. And some of you are too young, but those of you around my age remember. You ever remember those big Coke bottles? Dave, I know you remember the big Coke bottles, right? And you had the big Coke bottles or the big 7-up seven, seven bottles, and you can turn them in. And they gave you a deposit, right? You had a deposit, and after you drank the six-pack or eight-pack, you took them back in, and they gave you money for them. Do you remember that? Yep, okay. So you took them in. So you had a deposit. So when you returned them, you got your money back. You got your deposit back. And this is what's really, really beautiful about it. He's saying, hey, you know, when Christ says, when you open up that door, he puts an investment. He stamps us with his, his presence. And his presence is called the Holy Spirit. And that's a promise. That's our stamp. And guess what? When we get to heaven, you know, it's going to return to sender. It's going to return to the one who's given you the spirit, the spirit and our salvation of Jesus Christ. It's going to return to God. That's a beautiful thing. And he says, here's my proof. It, you're going to be stamped with the seal of my, my presence, of my Holy Spirit. And then again, remember when Jesus Christ left, and we talked about this last week, when he left this earth, he says, Jesus Christ is saying, I have to go. And all his apostles were watching when Jesus was resurrected and he was going up into the air. And they're like, geez, you know, we're all alone now. And, and they're sitting there and they're watching him leave. And then the angels over here on earth and, and Christ is being resurrected. And they're saying, hey, guys, he, he told you he was going to leave. He was going to walk with you. He taught you. He invested in you. You should have your helmet on. And, and now he's leaving. <clears throat> but the the angel who was there 
and he was coaching them. And Jesus Christ said, I'm leaving and I need to leave. So my spirit, my helper, the Holy Spirit, he goes, will stay with you. And this is what he's talking about, that stamp. And he said, hey, my Holy Spirit, he's going to stay with you. He's going to help you. He's going to guide you. He's going to shape you. He's going to mold you. And, but we need to be susceptible. We need to, to give our life to him. We need to know that, hey, Lord, you're in charge. I'm going to listen to that voice. Keep molding me, Lord. 2 Corinthians 3.8 says, I'm reading from the Amplified. And we all who <clears throat> unveiled with unveiled face, continually seen as in a mirror, the glory of the Lord are progressively being what? Do you see it up there? Can everyone see the word? Transformed into his image. So he's telling us that day of salvation, that was great, but it was only the beginning. He said, a beautiful thing, you're going to be transformed. And, and as that Holy Spirit is with you and inside of you, he's going to be talking to you. He's going to be witnessing to you. He's going to be helping you to be what? Transformed into what? The image of God. And this is what's so beautiful when we hear about the armor of God. He's saying, hey, it's the helmet of salvation. That knowledge you got, that wisdom you got, you know, that everlasting that the Holy Spirit is invested into your soul. He said, with that helmet of salvation, protect it. Protect it. Don't let it just fall. Remember what it is. Don't let it just fall. And, and even we, we even see a modern day ride helmet. It has a purpose of protecting the brain center, right? And he's using that into the Roman helmet. Remember, this is the Apostle Paul, and he's saying, protect it. Protect that beautiful thing that God has given you and this wisdom and this knowledge, and there has to be a transition. And if there's not a transition, there's a problem. So he says, protect it. So talk about my stand. Randy, where are you at? We're hiding back there. Randy, thank you for making this for me. I really love it. Uh, he did it for me. I called him in the middle of the night and said, I need a stand. <laughs> By Sunday, I think I called him Saturday. Or well, Friday, Friday night. Thank you for that. Okay. Um, so we're going to go for the, the Greek word, metamorpho. So we want to understand what's happening, this transformation. The Greek word is metamorpho. Okay. So it's the meaning to change the external form to be transformed or transfigured in form. So God never intended us to stay the same. He expected us to be what? Transformed. Transformed. Now, I gave you the story in the beginning of, of this, this motorcycle ride, and I was talking to you that how we've seen these people, and we had three people who are deceased. And, and I was telling you the, the thing that I remember the most is walking and seeing the, the motorcycles overturned and seeing that luggage rack or the, the carrying case cracked open and the helmets there. But the people were deceased. And when you see that, I was thinking, why would they not wear it? Why would they not wear their helmets? And maybe this could have prevented. And that challenges us for us today. You know, we talk about the helmet of salvation. Now, I want to go backwards a little bit. When we talked about the armor of God, it's, it's become so much common language, we don't understand the meaning of it. And he's talking about that helmet, protect it. And he says, and that word of God comes in, He's supposed to do what? Transform. If, we're, if our thinking is still stinking thinking like it used to be, God said, you're not getting it. We need to be transformed. What a beautiful day. I was thinking, well, maybe I should have a Mother's Day message because it's Mother's Day. And I thought, you know what? There's no better message than right now. Because you know what, mothers, you know what you're doing with your kids? You're transforming them. You're taking your kids and you're helping them to grow up to be responsible young adults. And, and you're teaching them. You're transforming them. You're coaching them. That's a form of transformation. And, and when they don't do something right, you talk to them nice, and then you tell them and you explain to them why. And then after that, um, you know, we turn around, and then, then sometimes we have to have a hands-on ministry. That's a whole other ministry. But that happens too, right? And we turn around, but we're always investing in our kids, and you're transforming them. That's what this word is saying. And that's why I'm giving you the words and let you see it on the screen. There has to be a transformation. We can't be where we used to be. We have to be growing. Things have to be 
You have to be dying and falling off, and then new sprouts and new roots and new buds have to be happening, but there has to be a transformation. And I, I like to use props because it helps us remember things that, you know what? God is saying he's, he's in the transforming business. And again, the Greek word is metamorpho, and uh, we had the definition up on the screen so you could see it. And I was working this, uh, this sermon out, and I'm studying, and there's so many things that I, I, I've learned. And uh, I was listening to this psychiatrist, and I was listening to his audio book that I was listening to, and he was saying, it was interesting, you know how elephants can weigh tons. Elephants can weigh tons. But a little baby elephant <clears throat> in the circus used to do, they used to take this little baby elephant and they used to chain him to a stake. And they would chain him to a stake. There we go, thank you. And they would chain him to the stake. <clears throat> and they said, as this elephant grew into a big, big, full-grown elephant, the elephant, even though he could break away from the stake, he never did. Because his mind was influenced and his mind, even when he was a little elephant, that no matter how hard he pulled, no matter what he could do, he couldn't get away from it. So when he grew up, he kept thinking, if you could bring up that next video, so you have this big, full-grown elephant, and you have this little stake where it's saying, there's no way it could hold this, this elephant that weighs tons, and he could pull out. But his mind was so affected when he was little, his mind was never transformed. So I'm reading this or listening to this audio book, and he's a Christian professor, and he was saying it's interesting. When we receive Christ, and we're living in the world, and we're living in, for example, I've met people who are addicted to drugs and alcohol, or being abusive and then became abusive, or had been violated, and all these things that affect them when they're small, and then they grow up, and unless they're healed or get counseling, and, and their mind is healed and transformed, they start doing the same thing. They start repeating what they came from. They start doing exactly what had happened to them. And he was saying, unless, and he was talking about it, he's a Christian psychiatrist, he was saying what's really neat, when you see the power of God come in and he heals the mind, he said, using secular programs don't work. But he goes, what was a miracle, seeing the blood of the Jesus Christ, seeing someone who's coming in who accepts that transformation, he says a, a beautiful healing happened. Now, I, I gave you the example over and over. Some people, we have visitors. I talked about a young man named Bobby Rickmeyer. So some of you say, oh, okay, can remember that story? He was a young man who Wisconsin went through six different recovery programs. And they said, we're not spending any more money on this young man because it's not working. He came through a Christian program and watching the blood of Jesus Christ, watching the redemption means to redeem, to restore, to renew, heal his mind. What happened? Healing. And, and this man is married. He has three kids. He's, he's head of the maintenance program at Mercury Marine in Fallon, Wisconsin. Incredible. But I, I'm telling you, we've seen this man. I visited him in jail numerous times where even his mom said, I'm just done with him. I can't do anything with him. But when he went in and had the redemptive spirit of Jesus Christ, changed his life. Changed his life. And that's what this means. Redemptive, salvation, Lord, help me become more like you. And I want to I wanna finish with this this morning. Is I, uh, I was uh, a young minister at the time when I was working as a chaplain for the Sheriff's Department. I, I, to this day, to this day, I can close my eyes and I can remember all these people and all these bodies kind of laying all over the place um, and seeing uh, this terrible tragedy that happened. And just asking after that, and then after that, um, they have a, a time where we go through all the photos and we take list of, of what happened in this fatality to find out some of these people, and, and they had a picture of the luggage rack with the helmets inside and saying, boy, it could have been prevented. Something could have, if, if they could have worn that. And folks, that's exactly what we're talking about today. He's saying, put on the helmet of salvation because it makes a difference. Protect what God's given you and capture every thought. 
And I don't, I don't know about you. Some days I have better days than other days in capturing every thought. But I, I've, um, our church was uh, 560, 580 people. I don't remember exactly. And it started from 12, 14 people. And watching what God had done and renewed and restored lives. And we, had, we, we, we work here with sex trafficking in this, this church with a golf outing and so forth. We had five women who were prostitutes in sex trafficking who came to our church. We paid about $10,000 each one and relocated them and, and put them in a safe place and we had help with the sheriff's department. It's a true story. What we had seen, their minds were so brainwashed. Their brains were so convinced that they would be nothing more than the life they lived in that they had a hard time escaping that. They had a, had a hard time being delivered from that because that's what they thought. Now, we can break it down to something not so severe, and we can say, you know what? I have women who have said, I haven't been the mom that I, I could have been or I should have been, or, or my mom wasn't the one who was supposed to be the, the mom she was to me, and she's living out of regrets and hurt and hardship. But you know what? Our God has come here to, to restore that. Our God is coming here to heal that, that he can say, maybe that has happened to you, but I'm the God who can restore. I'm the God who can heal. And, and that's where our faith comes in. We don't have to be locked into that. And I talked about the first message, when my first message when we talked about the armor. You know, the world says it has a solution. And, and then I, we used to work with a lot of alcoholics and drug addicts, and, and they used to come in. It was a pill-popping solution. It was a mess solution. It was a chemical addiction solution. But all those solutions worked from the outside in. And they changed them only for a small time. But you know, the Holy Spirit changes you from inside out. That Holy Spirit to help deliver you, to help be that conscience, changes you from inside out. And that's a beautiful thing, from inside out. And he's saying, you know what? You haven't been able to be delivered from that because you never surrendered and invited that Holy Spirit in who brings a conviction, who says, you know what? It's time. It's time, and I can help you now. It's time, and I can deliver you now. And when you start seeing life change, and we could look across the church and seeing these ex-prostitutes, these, these women who were captured and living that life, and seeing them finally being able to realize God had a promise, God had a purpose, God has a vision, and then they caught it. And then the transition started happening. That's a beautiful thing. But it also takes this. Hey, Sage, can I pick on you? You want to stand up? Just stand up right there. So I was talking to this young man who just graduated. <clears throat> and I was saying, he was saying, he came to youth group because somebody invited him. Somebody invited him. One person invited him. And he came around a group of friends. And his life changed. And his own words said, this changed my life. This church this youth group, this investment changed my life. So he's going to be going to the Air Force Academy. And, and we talked yesterday saying, you know what? Maybe he's going to have an opportunity to share his faith and his belief. But it started right here in Ogden because someone said, you know what? I'm not going to stay quiet. I'm going to tell you something. Why don't you come join us? Did it change your life? You can sit down. Thank you. <clears throat> See, that's... That's, that's the gospel lived out. So we're hearing the words of what happened. We read scripture. We talked about the helmet of salvation. But you know what? That's the gospel lived out. It's happening right here. But we, be, we become numb. We become stale. And, and it's happened and we don't even see it. And it's happened with a young man right here. Not, not the only one. There's more and more. That's a beautiful thing. You're making a difference. But we can't become numb from making a difference. We need to know that's our assignment and that's our purpose through Jesus Christ. And we saw, talk about that helmet of salvation. He said, guard those thoughts. And you know, folks, even though we had a church full of a bunch of people recovery, most of the people who were there were people who were hurt by pastors and hurt by other Christians. More. When we would have people stand up and say, hey, if, if you're recovered from drugs and alcohol, stand up. 
If you're recovered from divorce in your life, stand up. And you'd have about half the church. If you were hurt by other church people or pastors, the whole church would stand up. And that's the truth. So as Christians, we need to be careful we don't become toxic, right? It's like a, mo- a good mom gone rogue, right? We've got to make sure we don't become co- toxic. And we need to love people like Christ loves people. And we need to show them, hey, you know what? That salvation wasn't just for me. It's for you too. Because this young man had changed his life. And, and my wife and I, Ron and I, when we left, we were talking and saying, wow, that's beautiful. Our youth program, Water's Edge, you're doing a great job reaching out to the community. And I want to do a great job, but I want to even do a better job, right? Because how many other ones can we talk to or invite in? Because it's going to change their what? Their eternity. That's a pretty important thing. Change your eternity. Not that we have the power, but we know who does. Let's stand up and worship together.